Hey everybody, this is Ben Atkinson at LinkedIn, and this is our um, interview series, Inspiring Leadership. And this week, we're going to be talking about capital, ESG, and in, uh, responsible investing, what happens next. And as always, we're joined uh, by my friend, Jonathan Berman-Perks, who is our leadership expert, um, who'll be hosting the session. Jonathan, who are we interviewing this week? Thanks, Ben. And uh, we're very lucky to have Chaka Yumana. And Chaka um, is currently the executive director and head of ESG Edelman. And uh, he's had a fascinating career thus far, and it's going to be even more interesting as it goes on. Currently, as well as what he's doing there, he's also in non-executive roles at Advanced, uh, uh, one of the tech companies, and also another tech company, Digital Identity Net. And he sits on the advisory board of Signal AI. Um, he was in the House of Commons, many of you may have known, him as a Labour MP and also Lib Dem MP between 2010 and 2019. And before that, he was a solicitor and a city employment lawyer. And as the son of an entrepreneur from a mixed heritage family, he's very keen on challenging groupthink and tribalism. Without further ado, Chucker, welcome. Great to have you on board. Thanks very much, Ben and Jonathan. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm honoured to be part of this uh, LinkedIn interview. Well, it's great. And, and great it's great leaders, you. you know, bring a wealth of different experiences. And we've, we've been very lucky with the different people and the stories they've had to talk about. Um, let's begin with your current role, um, both as a NED, but as an executive director as Edelman, which you've just started. Tell us a bit about that. And, and um, then we can talk about ESG after that. But just tell us a bit about your current role. So I, I lead our consultancy practice, which um, gives advice to companies on how to integrate um, environmental, social and governance issues into corporate decision making so that the company is delivering for shareholders, but other stakeholders, too. And sometimes that concept is set up one against the other, that you have to either pick for wider societal stakeholders, you have to seek to deliver for them or you deliver for shareholders when the truth is that the relationship between the two is symbiotic, it's mutually dependent. And if you're not delivering for wider society, or at least also not seen to be doing that, then it actually will hit the bottom line. And uh, I suppose the example that many people are citing as evidence of that is what's happening at Boohoo at the moment, which has lost around a third of its market capitalization over the last couple of weeks because of ESG controversies around its supply chain. And so that's what I, I, I do at Edelman, and we're the biggest independently owned global um, corporate advisory firm, strategy and communications firm. So that's my, my main role and my bread and butter. Um, uh, but in addition to that, I also sit on the boards of three fantastic British companies, one large one, Advanced, which is the um, third largest software company in the UK. A medium sized company, but becoming larger by the day, Signal AI. I sit on its advisory board. Um, and uh, a smaller one, a Digital Identity Net, which is a fintech um, providing digital identity solutions for the UK. So I've, I've kind of dived straight back into business and the private sector um, after leaving politics and uh, am absolutely relishing it. So it's, yeah. good, it's good to be back, uh, as privileged as and as lucky as I felt having had the opportunity to serve the constituency I grew up in for, for a decade beforehand. Fascinating. We, we'll talk about that in a minute. And um, I think it is very interesting. Edelman, I, I used to come across with the trust index that it used to do each year, and it was showing where trust was lost. And I always remember looking at if you were a Republican, you had no time for the mainline media newspapers because Trump had trashed them all. And if you were a Democrat, you didn't believe in the government. Um, and, and the trust index had really dropped down as it got worse and worse between both sides. So I, I recommend that to people to look at the trust index from Edelman in different walks of life and where trust is up and trust is down. Um, but talking about trust, um, the, the next thing I'm quite interested in is what is ESG and why is responsible investing more important now than ever? Well, it really goes to the heart of what building a different variety of capitalism is all about. Um, look, there are different views on how we organize society. I think uh, capitalist systems are by their nature imperfect, but um, frankly, I don't see better alternatives that can deliver the goods, and deliver opportunity, wealth, prosperity, and happiness to more people. That said, there are different varieties of capitalism. 
And the old model that had dominated thinking for much of the last 25 to 30 years, which culminated in the global financial crash, because essentially that kind of red and tooth and claw capitalism um, uh, encouraged the behaviours that, you know, uh, were the uh, kind of um, ha handmaiden of, the, of, of what happened there. Um, that is clearly not a model of capitalism that I think is sustainable, is right for our economy or morally, uh, the, you know, where we want to be. And I, I don't think actually that citizens will put up with that model for any longer. But if you, like me, do believe a different variety of capitalism is what needed, a more responsible is what is needed, a more responsible stakeholder form of capitalism, then mm -hmm. we do need a, a way of operating in business that better in integrates environmental, social, and governance factors in what a business does. And so that is what, um, when you hear people talking about ESG, that is essentially what they are, what they are talking about. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I rewind 10 years ago to when I, you know, started off or just a, a bit less than 10 years ago when I took up my post as the Shadow Secretary of State for Business. And I, I don't like, you know, I think you all got to look forward and not always dwell on what happened in the past, but unless you learn the lessons from the past, you can't get the future right. But, you know, when we first started prosecuting this argument on the opposition benches and I sought to develop our argument around shared value, responsible capitalism, we were accused by our political opponents and frankly, some in business of being anti-business. Fast forward 10 years from that point and, you know, what was everybody talking about at the World Economic Forum's gathering in Davos this year? They were all talking about the need for a form of stakeholder capitalism and recognise that, frankly, unless there was reform and change, the you know very notion of any support for capitalism at all um, uh, potentially could fall away altogether. So that's what we're really talking about. And um, at risk of conforming to the stereotype of a, a, an ex-politician droning on forever, there's an important <laughs> distinction to be made between ESG and purpose, because purpose is about what a company is. What is it? What, why is it here beyond just making money? How does it fit into um, our society? ESG is very much about how you measure the impact of a company uh, on the environment, on society, and how it delivers on good governance. And in particular, how capital markets assess and view that, and then determine where to direct ESG funds and there's around 30 trillion dollars worth of ESG and sustainable funds chasing investment avenues and they look at the different ESG ratings of companies and funds to determine where to apply their monies and so it's very much around how capital markets measure um, what a company does for wider society and um, not 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 only what its purpose is which is a different mm. can be a different but related thing no. And I, and I think the whole thing of meaning, purpose, uh, and um, one of my clients has gone back to Bhutan, where, uh, having known the, the ruling family there, um, this whole point of gross domestic happiness, which um, I don't think we'll ever see uh, welded into ESG, but I think there needs to be something more about stakeholder capitalism as opposed to shareholder capitalism, where to many of the companies I come across, which there's a lot of wealth just in the hands of one or two individuals who perhaps founded it, millions or billions, and, and they don't have the best interests of everybody at all. It's, it's I think, really, I th yeah, really I think that's concerns. right. And, and, and think about what we've been doing at Edelman. Edelman's been, I mean, you mentioned the trust barometer has been essentially measuring ESG sentiment around companies for the best part of two decades. And it also is is probably the, the market leader, well, probably is recognized as a market leader in terms of a strategy and communications firm that advises asset managers who are the ones who have all these ESG funds. And so for me, it was a natural destination for that mm. reason in terms of what I wanted to do, because I'd spent, you know, 10 years arguing for a better and more responsible capitalism. Um, and that was kind of from a kind of ideological policy, theoretical standpoint. Whereas mm. what, what I always had in my mind that when I left politics, I would seek to get onto the coalface and try and make some of that theory, you know, 
practical and, and, and bring it about. And so I feel very privileged to be able to do that, both at Edelman, mm. but also through being involved with three other fantastic British companies. Yeah, no, I think I think you've positioned it. It's very aligned. And, and I can see why you end up with the three, the three tech companies that you have doing so well. And also that uh, Edelman is a great role for you. Let's go on to what's going on around us right now with COVID-19, um, the, the global pandemic and the impact of it on the economy and how many years it will go on. Just interested in how it's personally affected you and your family uh, and your friends and, and also what your perspective is about it and how well or how badly it's been handled in this country compared to other countries. Well, I suppose um, what, what I'm most concerned about, and it sounds, sounds rather pious and sanctimonious to, 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 to say it really, is, is I suppose less how it's impacted on me and more how it's impacted on, on, on others. I'm incredibly lucky. Um, I, you know, come with a you know, particular education and background, which has meant that, that, you know, lockdown life and COVID hasn't been anywhere near as bad for me as it has been for other people. Um, I, you know, we've been through a lot of upheaval. My my job has changed over the last seven or eight months. My second daughter arrived ten days before lockdown hit, and just you know, working out how to manage a three and a half year old and a a, a newborn um, under lockdown was was quite a challenge. But then I, I I look at how so many of the people I used to represent in, in Streatham, um, which is one in one of the most deprived local authority areas in England, how they practically would have had to have, li have lived through it. And I, and I think I've got absolutely nothing to complain about. So from a personal point of view, you know, we've had the, the same challenges as everyone else in the sense of not being able to see loved ones and have that interaction with, 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 with family and, and friends. I think for the world, I mean, who knows where we are going to be in five to 10 years time, but I suppose here are just a few thoughts. I think the first thing is what I would hope, but I think hopefully will transpire has happened out of this crisis, is that big long-term, often abstract threats to the way that we live will be hopefully taken more seriously after this pandemic. People have been warning of a global pandemic on this scale for years now, and nobody really took it seriously, because if they had, they would have made the right preparations, put the requisite investment necessary into our health systems, et cetera, in, in, all over the world. And that clearly didn't happen, not just in the UK, but in other places too. So, you know, one hopes that, for example, with the big, um, you know, looming disaster, which is climate change, finally people will wake up and listen to the scientists and the experts and act with the urgency required. I suppose that's the first thing. The second thing is that I think it has shone a light on the existing inequalities in the world and it has led to a degree of enlightenment in a way that I'm not sh sure we appreciated those who, you know, I say we, those who said that we were going to get a pandemic, I'm not sure they appreciated the pandemic would do and how it would ignite a renewed focus on issues of inequality. Um, because it's not just that if you are of colour and you are from a deprived community, you are more likely to be infected and killed by this disease. I think it's also that there's an appreciation from everybody, regardless of background, that were it not for the work that many of our key workers do, who are drawn from the socioeconomic demographic I've just described, they may also be at more risk. You know, it, when you, if you're a wealthy person, have been infected with COVID and had to perhaps go on a ventilator in hospital, the people looking after you there are not going to be earning what you're earning. And so I think it has led to a, a kind of reassessment of do we really want to continue to live like this in in post-covid times i think the third thing is that no doubt this is going to have an enormous economic um hit and uh, it does provide an opportunity out of economic disaster to to give birth to a different model of uh, capitalism a uh, better more responsible and productive capitalism um uh, and on the one hand i think it could be quite darwinian what happens 
uh, to businesses. It will be kind of survival of the fittest and even some of the biggest businesses with enormous balance sheets could fall by the wayside as a result of COVID and not just because of the direct effect, but the indirect effects like, you know, we've had a Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft was saying that he believed uh, we are just going through, you know, in a matter of months, years of uh, digital acceleration. Now, if you're a business, you know, some household names who have not adapted to the new digital world we live in, uh, you may not survive this. So that's the downside. But the upside is this, we can build something different out of this. So, I, I mean, there's a lot to cover there, but those are just mm -hmm. three kind of macro thoughts on, on, on what's going to happen. Yeah, Ben, I see a question bubbling up for you. Any any questions you want to ask uh, at this stage before going to the next one? And yeah, I, I was just sort of thinking with, with um, your view on how the world has dealt with it because you've been in politics and I, I think that that um, we've really sort of seen how different leaders have have, have dealt with it in different ways and and, and a lot of um, ego has come into it and, and that has really affected people's ability to to deal with with this um, human human problem and I just wondered at your sort of views on, on on the different leaders that have dealt with um, the crisis in over the world well I think the level of global cooperation, uh, to deal with what is a global pandemic has been lamentable, mm. frankly. Um, and, you know, if you look, compare and contrast to 2008-9 and the global financial crash then, when Gordon Brown convened a summit in April 2009 of the G20 to put in place a global framework to prevent catastrophe um, from happening out of that global financial crash, we haven't seen anything like that level of coordinated action on the part of governments around the world. Um, I do think, however, that the central bankers have acted in a coordinated fashion and have shown, uh, you know, perhaps provided a bit of example to their political masters. Well, they're all independent, but, you know, the, 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 the governments in their, in their backyards on how you can work globally to resolve a big problem like this. I think in the UK, actually, in fairness to, um, well, you might not have had the level of global cooperation necessary. I think that the Treasury and the Bank of England have worked quite well together to put in place at scale some enormous um, packages of support. And, you know, of course, more needs to be done. They haven't got everything right. Um, but I think they do deserve praise for what they have managed to do. Um, but I also think the nature of what it is to be a politician, and, and unfortunately, um, the skill set required to make it the top in politics is not the skill set required to actually practically deliver um, big logistical projects. Um, mm. I, I, I was quite, well, I, I, I don't want to slag off uh, former colleagues because I think that politics is a noble profession and frankly, you know, it's in a huge privilege to serve, but there's a huge amount that you have to put up with and your family has to put up with while you're doing that job. So, I mean, Lord knows they don't need me to, to become heaping negative criticism on their backs. Um, but, uh, but I do think we need to probably to reassess, you know, if we don't like the set of politicians that we have, and a, a poll after poll shows that even more members, you know, more of the public think that, then we do have to look at how, how you know, what are the skill set we're demanding of politicians? And is it the right skill set? Because I think, you know, some, some, aspects of government have been shown to be really quite flawed and wanting in this respect and it's probably not just the politicians you know if you if you're of a civil service background you haven't necessarily received the training that you need to, to handle this type of event now you could say but this type of event is exceptional and extraordinary though therefore to, to kind of build your whole system around it would be um perhaps unwise given it's, it was not going to be the normal but i think it, it does kind of highlight, you know, there's a bit of a question that needs to be asked, but if we want better political leaders, then how do we change the system so that we have that? Um, well, yeah, it, it is interesting that you say that, uh, Jacko, because I'm just looking at uh, Sean Taylor, who's um, a very good contributor, and he's also done his sort of Friday um, reviews of what's going on in the economy and the world. I, I, I do like reading his little short blog that he does. Well, with you reading that one. Um, I, I think that the one he was asking, maybe you could put this one up, uh, the second one, maybe, um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> Ben, if you would. Um, sure, sure. At the moment, businesses that are failing, uh, uh, falling over, I think, or failing or falling over, did have problems before COVID. However, those okay businesses with bad leadership are being found out and are struggling to emerge from the lockdown. Uh, he was asking if I had some examples of poor leadership in the current space, but I, I think it's 
we, we need good leaders in politics. And, and this is where, as you're saying, some of the politicians, their, their skill set and what gets them into it doesn't make them good for uh, thinking strategically and leading at the strategic level. I interviewed recently General Sir Rupert Smith, who really did get the strategic political situation as commander of the Armoured Brigade in the Gulf War and then also looking after the UN forces in Bosnia. But um, poor leadership, good, good leadership in business and in politics. Any view, Chaka, from you? Well, I think, uh, well, I, I suppose I've said what I've, I've said about politics and, uh, I, you know, it's a function of the system. Um, if you know how to gain the system to be selected in one of the main parliament, two main political parties in the UK, you can you can end up in the cabinet. Um, but that may not necessarily be a function of your abilities. And, you know, there are people in the cabinet and in the shadow cabinet who, you know, would agree with me <laughs> on that because I've spoken to some of them about it over, over time. I think in business, I think people did learn from the fallout uh, following the global financial crash, but also the fallout following the austerity that came after and how unpopular it was. And I think they, there was a realisation that you couldn't just do business as usual. Um, and if you sought to do so, um, ultimately it would hit the bottom line and the long term performance of your firm. Uh, Edelman actually recently in the middle of the lockdown did a survey across 12 markets on what citizens expect of their companies. And over half expected um, companies to put the interests of stakeholders, not just shareholders, um, first, even if that meant in the short term that the company sustained a financial hit, a third of respondents had successfully persuaded friends or family not to buy products or services from brands they perceived to behave not be behaving appropriately during the pandemic. So I think it just illustrates, frankly, that the bad business is bad business in the way that it perhaps wasn't before. Um, and I think, you know, whereas after the last crisis, the global financial crash, a lot of people, particularly in the banking sector, just sort of go back to business as usual after they'd had an enormous handout and support from the state. I think people realise this time round that they cannot expect the support from the state without there being certain strings attached. So if you're going to try and do having taken financial support, you know, share buybacks or enormous bonuses for your senior executive team or, you know, um, big dividends. Um, you know, these are going to be big hot potatoes and massively controversial if you try to push those through, having survived with the benefit of state support during the pandemic. And so I think, you know, that, you, that yes, there is good and bad in business too, but I do think, you know, from my experience in business now, there has been a lot of learning since then. Yeah, and, and we do need to change the way things are. Um, I was interviewing a uh, female in the, in the fintech space and she said, you know, we've still got a lot of financial services run by white middle class men. Uh, and there's not much diversity on the female side. And there's certainly not much in vain. And, and that really takes me into sort of Black Lives Matter and the tragic death of George Floyd and the continuing protests. You know, what do you feel is the impact of that? Um, how, how much will it gain traction? You know, just what are we going to do to to change things? Because things do need to change. Well, they certainly do. I mean, I, I, I felt uh, quite eff obviously affected by the George Floyd um tragedy i mean it, it it was a murder but it was a tragedy for a family ordinary people just trying to get on in life um uh, i think in some respects i felt more affected by the death of stephen lawrence in 1993 and the subsequent mcpherson report um into the botched inquiry into his murder um by the police perhaps because it was closer to home Mm -hmm. um, perhaps because he, like me, was a, 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 a you know teenager of brown complexion living in South London and I was around the same age as he was. Um, so, you know, the inequalities and what George Floyd's death exposed were nothing new. You know, this had been going on for decades. You know, mm -hmm. I, I luckily up to now, I haven't had the same experience of other people of my background and colour 
um, from the police, but my father certainly did. You know, my, my father was beaten black and blue by the police outside the front of our house in the 1980s. And this is not an unusual experience. So I am not playing the violin. I mean, as dreadful as that was, and no mm. police officer was disciplined, um, you know, this was not an unusual experience for a family of that background. Um, now, I think what Floyd did, though, is that has led to a, a an enormous amount of enlightenment. And perhaps it's partly because it was so stark and it's so vivid in the way that these things are now shown and illustrated on social media that it makes mm. it real for people in a way that perhaps it wasn't before. And I've just been very struck by how, this is very anecdotal, not scientific, but how so many people of a European background, white people that I know, particularly, I'd say, quite a posh kind of middle class background, who have been quite affected by it and just didn't really appreciate the black experience. It wasn't just that obviously they saw this happening in 2020 to a black man, but it was kind of like, really has that been happening to black people for this long? And, it's, you know, how, and you're just like, yes, it has, where have you been? And I think it has woken up a lot of people to, to, to the racial injustice suffered by black people like never before. Now, as you said, it's all very well, the warm words, isn't it terrible? I now appreciate it. Um, but unless you back that up with action, no one's going to take you seriously. And, and Nike is a good example of this. Nike, you know, was quite vocal, good, quite activist about supporting the Black Lives Matter campaign in the wake of the death of George Floyd. Good. But then people looked at Nike's board, a brand which, you know, has used black culture, many people would say, for commercial purposes. No mm -hmm. problem with that, you know, promoting what, you know, is seen as part of black culture. Um, but... You know, people looked at their all white board and were like, hang on just a minute. Are you serious? Are you, can you really go out and say what you're saying when you look at your board? And so I think in that respect, it just highlights how much further there is to go. And, you know, you look in uh, capital markets, financial services, um, uh, financial news, one of the um, information services for the city was just reporting today. There are only three senior black investment bankers in the city at the moment. Three. Um, I know one of the Bernie Mensah at Bank of America, but just three. Um, I'm proud, actually, you know, to, to sit on the board of a company, which was one of the portfolio companies of Vista Equity Capital, which was co-founded by Robert Smith. Um, and, and Robert um, has sat on the board of Advance quite recently, and we're part of his portfolio, uh, Vista's portfolio of companies. And he is the most successful, wealthy African-American businessman of the moment. Um, but, you know, people like Robert are few and far between. So... You know, we've got to ensure that more people are coming through. And in that respect, actually, I mean, certainly looking back to my time as a corporate employment lawyer in the city, when I used to go to like completion meetings where all the documents are signed at the end of an M&A transaction, for example, I was always the only person, usually the only person of colour, never mind the only person of African Caribbean origin. Um, and, you know, while things have improved a bit, there's a hell of a lot further to go. But at least in our country here in the UK, there it has been that acknowledgement through that McPherson report in 1999 that there is institutional racism in the UK. And at least we there's an acknowledgement of the problem, because unless you acknowledge the problem, you can't do anything about it. Whereas in the States, they're still having that debate. In some states, they don't even accept these institutional barriers or haven't until the murder of George Floyd. So I think there's a lot further to go. And I mean, I always, I suppose I was quite careful when I, back in politics, uh, you know, when I talked about this, I was, I was very, selective, if you like, when I intervened on, on issues like this, because I, I I didn't want to be pigeonholed. So I felt that also held, you know, people, black people back into um, only talking about black issues. And I found that a lot of people actually in um, the, the, the different black communities loved the fact that I was known for talking about business and economic issues. And they saw me in the Treasury Select Committee and all that. And I wasn't talking about what was seen as as black issues but i always yeah. did talk about those issues but i talked about them on my terms when i wanted to talk about them not when the media decided they needed a black voice or something yeah and it is interesting um my wife runs a charity for uh, vulnerable girl, girls trafficking modern day slavery and uh, around the uk in some of the poorest areas and uh, the home office is very supportive of them one of the trustees is pamela hutchinson um who's from a bain background and she's head of diversity and inclusion at bloomberg and she said, this, this has really produced a real surge in people wanting to do something for once. And there's a huge amount of investment, corporate investment being put 
behind wanting to help this, but it, in some ways it's not quite sure where to put the money. I mean, there's actually a and they are. I mean, but I, I, I definitely, I mean, we'll have to wait and see the data. But I do think something's going on and something's happening here. You yeah. know, I, I had the head of a, a, a very well-known hedge fund ring me up in the wake of George Floyd and say, I know it's different here in the UK. I know the context of if, if here is different and the, the black experience is different. But, you know, I, I want us to do something as a firm about this. And I want you to be very frank with me about what you see in our firm. And I was pretty frank with him about what I saw in the firm. And, you know, if you are only recruiting from Red Brick Universities or Oxbridge, you know, there's there are enormous barriers to entry for a lot of black people, um, particularly given that the, you know, the, the black middle class is still pretty infant in the UK who are just, you know, often not going to make it to Oxbridge, but will be your best bankers. You watch, you know, some some of these young people coming through, you are missing an opportunity here. And so if you're really serious about doing something about it, you need to look at your elite recruitment policies. And mm -hmm. I don't, you know, of course you want excellence. But uh, there are different places you can go for excellence. The question is, are you prepared to put the resource into finding that excellence where it may be? Um, and in the end, you know what? It will pay off for you because you'll make even more money than you do already. And so uh, we're giving quite a, you know, we've actually had, it's been refreshing. Actually, lots of people come to us at Edelman. Lots of um, corporates have come to us for advice on this. Um, and uh, all over, you know, obviously, particularly in the US and UK. Mm. I think it's great that it's actually pushed everything back up the, the hierarchy right to the top where people at the top of businesses have to start making changes rather than pushing it down to yeah. their recruitment teams and or, you know, or they, things like that. Where, yeah, you, you, don't, you don't want to be a token gesture, you know, and hmm. you don't need to engage in tokenism to sort this out because there are a lot of very, very talented people of African-Caribbean background who are amongst mm. the very best that you're missing out on. Mm. And yeah. so, um, I, I mean, I don't, I, I like to think, I, I don't think my background intervened into any of the, the decisions of, of the new roles I've taken up recently. I, I very much hope not, but you know, it's a bonus that I have that background. Mm. Now I'm, I'm slightly different, I'm a public figure, all that kind of stuff, but you, we're not looking for tokenism here. I think yeah. people just want mm. to be given a fair crack of the whip and fair access. And there isn't fair access because if you're, of a particular background, you get more access than others. It's as simple as that. Yeah. And that's very interesting turning to Ben. I mean, Ben, you're in LinkedIn, you're in the recruitment bit of LinkedIn. What are you seeing change in, in LinkedIn to do with more fairer inclusion and variety and diversity in the way people are recruited? What are you seeing? I, th I think, um, Chucky, you, you sort of hit the nail on the head. I think it, it, it opened people's eyes. Because we're in a in a company who who probably until a few months ago we would look around and go we're we're doing pretty well, um, mm. and then you have to look around and you really sort of dig into it and you go no we're not we're we 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 we've not done well and we haven't done well enough and there are rules in place or expectations in place which actually make the recruitment process broken like you said we, we, we want to recruit from say um, a certain set of management consultancies or, or um, certain set of universities with this sort of um, background which automatically lowers the pool of people that you're going to get from um, a, a, a BAME background um, automatically and then also the process of actually going through interview and, and meeting um, the company how are we actually making that a comfortable and uh, encouraging process to people who, who turn up and they're on a panel interview and, and there's not anyone of an, an ethnic minority within that, that, that interview process. Um, it, it, it makes a massive difference. And all the people that I've, I've spoken to have had, although, although we, we felt we were doing a good job, there's just, it's just not actually true and we, we need to do so much better. So I think it's just opening that, that Pandora's box of actually taking a good hard look and um, and putting those changes in place, which um, which is a, a positive that's, that, that's come out. And uh, we're going to just in a moment do the healthy, wealthy and wise uh, series of questions. But um, brief, um, you talked about father being written black and blue at the front door. Brief life experiences and how it shaped you as a leader. Because this whole series is about inspiring leaders and people have said to us that you are an inspiring leader and certainly I've respected what you've 
stood for and the things you've spoken for. Um, what, what shaped you, two or three things during your life as you were growing up that shaped the kind of leader you are today and the, and the that sense of public duty that you had and, and also avoiding this group thing and tribalism? I think, uh, firstly, being born into the family that I was born into. Um, I'm, I'm of a mixed heritage background, but, but not only, I suppose, in terms of my ethnicity, but also my class. Um, you know, I am uh, half Nigerian, a quarter Irish and a quarter English. And uh, I'm an Igbo in Nigerian terms as well. One of the, the, the three big tribes in, in Nigeria. That, that carries its own culture and history, which is very rich and vibrant too. And so that cacophony of uh, cultures is, is just completely defines so much of, of, of who I am. But actually, um, I think you cannot ignore the intersection of, of class and race as well. And my experience is very different to a lot of mixed race, you know, guys of, of my age, growing up in the constituency I used to represent on, on one of our social housing estates in Streatham, I, I cannot pretend to have had anything like the obstacles that they would have had because I have a mixed class background as well. I mean, my, my, my father arrived here in this country, my late father in the 1960s and 1964 with no money, literally no money, just his bags and his clothes. Um, a working class black guy in every sense of the words. And, uh, but my mother came from an upper, you know, middle class background, uh, the daughter of a, um, you know, a high court judge who was one of the, you know, MI5 interrogators of the Cambridge spies before that, and a, you know, a well known barrister. So um, I think that that's why I, I don't like pigeonhole, being pigeonholed. I do not like groupthink and the herd mentality because. We're not a feature of the herd, my family, in that sense at all. So I'd say that's one big um, in, uh, thing that's impacted me. Secondly, growing up in an a di a incredibly diverse, multifaceted area like Lambeth, I no longer live in, in, in Lambeth, but it, it's always part of me, it's, you know, defined who I am. I think certainly in terms of, you know, what makes me a social democrat and a liberal, so much of that is to do with having grown up in the community. And thirdly, definitely the power of enterprise. You know, I saw in particular the impact that entrepreneurialism and enterprise had on him and why he was so successful. And if he wasn't successful in the way that he was, I wouldn't have had the same opportunities that I did. So I do believe in the power of business to do good. But of course, there are different business models, practices and behaviours and different models of capitalism. Um, and you've got to find the right one. And this is something that often for me in political terms meant that I didn't actually have a proper home because on the left, they don't believe in capitalism in the main full stop. And even if they do a bit, it's very, very reluctantly so. And on the right, they believe in untrammeled, almost libertarian forms of organization where you don't have, you know, you, you think a free market is a free market, which is nonsense because no business can survive in isolation from a decent infrastructure, decent education system, educating its workforce. <laughs> and so, that, that set of beliefs around the power of enterprise and what they can do working in, in partnership with business also very much has um, influenced my thinking. So I, I just give those those mm -hmm. those three things really: it's family, it's place, and 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 business. Fantastic. So Ben, over to you. And also, we'd like to encourage people to ask questions. We've had uh, Sean, and we've had another LinkedIn user which Ben can use in a moment. But please, there's 150 of you I know who've um, attending this uh, this session. Please do post up questions. Uh, we've got about uh, 12 minutes or so left, so let's uh, let's have some questions coming up. Ben, over to you for a quick fire. Yeah, great stuff. Yeah, it'd be good to, good to hear from everyone. Uh, get have some questions, um, but uh, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, we always ask our interviewees uh, a few questions about the habits that have made them successful, um, and we put them in three buckets of healthy, wealthy, and wise. So, um, just to sort of start off, just looking at how you, in in um, sort of high pressure and and um, and through this crisis, how have you stayed healthy, both physically and mentally? Um, I've surrounded myself with with three very strong women, <laughs> my two daughters <laughs> and my wife, and that has kept my feet on the ground, gave it, given me a very clear purpose, which in the context of a pandemic, my number one priority has been to keep my family safe and well. 
mm-hmm. and do you know whatever it took to to, to secure their, their, their you know to secure them and so that 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 is what has inspired and driven me above um all else really in this particular context yeah it's, it's one of the things about this the, this whole crisis is having it's quite, it's quite you go back to, to get up and, and primitive do, things right yeah yeah it's primitive yeah thing, definitely in a way it's kind of it's an animal instinct in a way mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah yeah you need that drive because because i found that you sort of fell out of of good habits and could fall into sort of bad habits of not not exercising enough not not well, getting up and when you, and when you have a new uh, yeah when you've got a newborn I, <laughs> that's, that is nigh on impossible to maintain your usual healthy exercise regime but i have just uh, um, I, I've, I've taken a bit of a break this week but um, in the the couple of weeks leading into it, I have managed to start getting out, um, running again, and doing some exercise. Because it, I think, if you yeah. don't stay healthy, actually physically, it's very hard to have a healthy mind. Uh, Such I think, a big difference. I yeah. think good, good good health and 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 being fit um, is is a massive determinant actually of your mental health mm. as well. Yeah. Yeah. And your little one's four months old. Did you say? Five and a half months one and uh, three over just over three and a half the other. Wow. Okay. So an interesting lockdown for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so the second second question. Obviously, there's going to be lots of people out there who are um, in difficult um, financial situations. So we always ask our guests, what's a piece of um, financial advice that they've been given, or, or do they give regularly? Budget. Budget and avoid getting into debt. Um, and if you are going to get into debt, do it in a controlled fashion and budget. Um, but it, it was one thing that my parents instilled into me: never just go and spend you know, willy nilly. You know, you if you're going to overspend, plan to overspend. Um, and yeah. so, budgeting is 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 I think absolutely vital. And I don't profess to have been a saint in the management of my own finances, um, but I think. I think budgeting and keeping a handle on what's going in and out is absolutely essential. It's, and it's not, I don't think it is that challenging a thing to do, particularly given there's lots mm. of technology out there now that the banks offer that help can help you do that. Yeah, yeah. But it's having that impetus to go, right, sit down, do do the ins and outs and, 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 and write totally, it down. That's it. I totally recognise that if you don't have enough coming in full stop, you know, it's easy to budget when you've got money coming in. So I, I totally understand yeah. those who watch you and go, yeah, but, you know, if I've, because I used to, you know, I had, I, I, I've helped a lot of people in that position. Mm. Um, you know, my office, we helped over 18,000 people with their different problems uh, during my 10 years in politics. So I do get that. Okay. So we've got a question that's coming from um, Chantel uh, Kelly. So I'll just put this one up. So. Okay, so to what extent do you think lockdown has contributed to the focus on racial inequality in the UK? Do you think that the return to normal will see this issue lose momentum? I don't think it will, actually, um, because I think that, you know, <laughs> the, if, you, if you look at our key workers who've got us through this, um, mm. amongst certain occupations, there is a disproportionate number of people from an ethnic minority background. There are a disproportionate number of people who are low paid. And I think when it comes to determining the pay settlement that our, you know, many of our key workers get, that is not just going to fall away as an issue after this. I think it has reminded people in a way, uh, not just visibly the NHS, but across a whole swathe of different services, which are, you know, public utility services we utterly rely on. I think it has reminded people of how essential it is what they do, or, you know, how essential what they do is. And so I'm not sure that's going to fall away myself, actually. I think the, the, the debates about how we fund this at the same time as reduce the debts when we can is, you know, going to be with us for a long time yet. I mean, uh, it was only in the noughties, I think, we paid off the debts incurred by, the, you know, as a result of the Second World War. Mm-hmm. And and so you know these issues are not going to go away anytime fast. I don't think, and I c- certainly think you know to what extent has it contributed to the focus on racial inequality massively? I don't think actually in my lifetime I've seen actually one event uh, really kind of bring a focus like this. 
you know, and, it, uh, you know, we've lived through, I've lived through different uh, events, like the murder of Stephen Lawrence I mentioned before, the Brixton riots that happened in, in, in Lambeth where I grew up. Uh, when I was living there, you know, um, I don't think I think I, th I don't think we've seen anything on this scale that has had such a profound impact on these debates. Yeah, yeah. no, definitely. Um, and another question from um, Sean Taylor. So, what next? And um, do you agree we are seeing the most liberal conservative PM in a very long time? Well, I'm 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 going to be staying in in business. I, I love being back um, in, in 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 business. I'm back in the private sector. Uh, it was an enormous privilege to to to, to serve, uh, to to be in public service for, uh, you know, the ten years that I was in it. But I, I was never. It was never my intention to do a Ken Clark and do multiple decades in the House of Commons. And it was always my intention, actually, particularly when my children became aware of what I did and aware of other, you know, parents, uh, other children's parents talking about their dad, and that I, I was going to be out by by that point. Um, and the um, the electors in the cities of London and Westminster determined that it should be December 2019 that I left politics, and that was fine. I knew when I left the Labour Party that that was quite likely to happen at the next general election. Um, and so at the moment, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to building a really good career, making a positive contribution um, through business. And um, I don't know about the, the current prime minister. I think time will tell. I don't, you know, I'm not politically where he is. I think that there have been some enormous mistakes made through the course of COVID-19. But I do appreciate that we are asking ordinary people to do quite extraordinary things through this pandemic. Yeah. And um, my, my kind of criticism is tinged with a sense of, look, you know, this is an unprecedented situation. And I never thought that this was a group of extraordinary individuals <laughs> and to therefore um, expect them to do extraordinary things. Pat was asking, um, uh, too much. And I, I do think we need a government and opposition that are good and effective and are competent. It's in everybody's interest that that, that, that happens. Mm -hmm. So I want to see the government do well. I want to see the the opposition do well. And, you know, I'm still a Liberal Democrat member. I want my, my party to do well. But I, I've left party politics, so I'm not going to indulge in that. Great. Uh, another question from um, from Chantel. Uh, how can asset managers provide assurance that their firms are not just greenwashing? Well, th we actually, um, how you could do that is by, by coming to us at Edelman to advise you on that because we, we advise companies <laughs> on how they can illustrate um, that they, you know, their, their claims to ESG integration are real. And what's a really good thing is it's in it, it, on the on the on the buy side amongst asset managers. This ESG fund space is incredibly competitive in a crowded market. There are loads of people offering ESG products to those millennials that I was I think I was talking about earlier, who in particular are not just going to put their long term investments anywhere. They want to see that uh, their money is going to companies that have a good ESG profile. And they're going to become an increasingly influential group, these millennials, particularly. I mean, it's a rather depressing to say, it, I suppose. But when they start inheriting money from the baby booners, they're going to be a very big investment force. And if you don't have a good ESG profile, um, they are not going to be wanting to invest in you. And all the asset managers are competing to get their money to, to invest. And so, you know, one of the things we do is that we provide counsel on how you can illustrate um, that you have the best CSG products. Right. Well, very good um, cool. questions and very good answers. We're just coming to the last couple of minutes. Um, you, were, you were about to go on to the whys. We're just interested on this theme of leadership. If you were to give a, a top tip or two, practical top tip about uh, being an inspiring leader or just inspiring leadership in others, whatever your community, whatever your background, what would be your, your tip on that? And then I'll let uh, Ben end with uh, the usual question we normally end with. Oh, there's a, it's hard to give one top tip. I'd say there's a few. Um, and, I, you know, look, I, 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 I don't claim to be particularly inspirational. Um, and I certainly don't claim to have been a saint and, and to have got everything right over the years. But I suppose if you get things wrong, you, you, the most important thing is to learn from it. Yeah. And so the, the few things I'd offer is, is, is stay humble and don't always believe your hype. <laughs> Yeah. Which is, you know, you, you can create a lot of that. And when you can get when you get carried away with that, it, it can warp your judgment somewhat. And, uh, you know, I've been guilty of that, um, like, like the next person. The second thing is, I do believe that 
the best organizations um, operate where they have a degree of leadership through consensus, but you do need somebody to lead and to decide when you have um, ruminated on what it is you want to do. You do need a leader um, and the best leaders um, put in uh, the different varied groups there may be and encourage people to um, perhaps give a contrary view and then come to a, a decision. So I suppose that is a second thing. And I'd say, say a third thing for me is, is always to have a plan B and a plan C because you don't know what's going to happen. Um, and often, you know, you are operating in an environment where you don't control what will happen. I mean, that was particularly the case in politics. I'm well aware it can be the case in business and goodness knows we realize that when we're living through a big pandemic. But if you have a plan A, a plan B and a plan C in mind, then I just think it makes it a lot easier to navigate your way through everything that is going on. And I suppose that the, the final thing I would say is just you really do need to dig deep and ask yourself why you're doing what you're doing and why you want to do what you're doing and what really matters to you. And one of the things that I'm constantly surprised by, in some respects, but also not because of just the way the world is, is that I had a perfect storm where I had a clash between my private family life and my working life when I, I briefly dipped my toe into the um, leadership race for the Labour Party in 2015. And people always think there's some kind of scandal that, you know, some skeleton in the, in the closet, whatever, that lay behind that decision. But it was a perfect clash between the two. <laughs> and I decided I don't really want to live my life where it's utterly dictated to uh, by my job and that the, the, the lives of those around me are dictated to by my job either. And I knew that dipping my toe into that leadership base was going to invite a, even more scrutiny of me than there was already, but I didn't really anticipate it would lead to so much scrutiny and disruption for those around me. And I, it led me to question, do I, you know, this will just be the start of it and do I really want them to subject them to this? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I remember actually in 2016 being interviewed about this um, on a programme here in the UK called Good Morning Britain um, by two of my favourite presenters, actually, Susanna and Piers Morgan, Susanna Reid and Piers Morgan. And they, 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 you know, they gave me the whole, they really grilled me on this and said, come on, Chuka, you know, you can imagine Piers Morgan, you know, you, come on, don't give me that, you know, how naive do you be? You know, you know, and they were looking at me like I was a real idiot. And, and as it happened, I think both of them had had things about their private lives splashed over the press, which had affected their families. And I said, I said to them, I said, well, come on, you've both have been through it. I think you've both actually been through it this week. You know, you've had incidences where your family have been pulled into stories around you and you've been subject to a certain level of scrutiny. And you more than most, you both know how difficult that is. And it invites you to make certain decisions. And it was totally changed the kind of tone of the conversation and their reaction, actually, because I think it kind of shook them out of it and, and, and reminded them that we might be public figures, but we're human beings and we have families we've got to look after as well. And don't yeah. and I was basically saying to them, don't pretend to me that you you haven't had these contradictions and challenges in managing your work life and your private life and how the two impact on it. And and so Whatever you're doing, I think you've always got to ask yourself why you're doing it, how it impacts you, how it impacts, of course, your family. And by doing it, you really remaining true to who you are. And I was never going to be one of those people who, where, for example, politics utterly dominated every damn thing I did in my mm. life. I was never going to be that kind of person, which is probably why I didn't end up Such doing a big cost, a isn't it? That's right. And, and I think those mm. who make it, they have made that conscious decision. And they've mm. pulled in their entire families to be part of that decision. And when it came down to it, I was like, I'm not doing that to my family um, because I don't mm. feel it's right. And I don't feel it's true to me. It wasn't. And I don't feel it was right for me and my family. I'm not going to pass judgment on what other when others have made that decision. So I, I think that's very, very important. Whatever you do, particularly in senior roles, is to ask yourself, why am I doing this? Does this fit with who I am and what I want to be? Yeah, very wise. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you. Great, thanks so great much. For that. And thanks to everyone watching and listening. That's fantastic. And I think just to just to wrap up, I know, know we, we always ask all the three questions because it'd be uh, uh, nice to sort of know, is there a piece of wisdom that you'd like to sort of live your life by? And, and that last sort of comment seems to seems to fit quite, quite well in that. But if you've got another comment, that'd be, be great. 
So that's it. That's it, basically. Those yeah. are the four. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, really good having you on the show. Thanks, Jacob. Thank you very much, yeah. guys. Thanks a lot. Good night. Take care. Thanks. Bye.